本日は HP ワールドツアー東京にご来場いただきまして誠にありがとうございますただいまよりセッション ID SP の4スペシャルセッション4モビリティの講演を開始いたしますこちらの講演では IoT、モノのインターネット、そしてウェアラブル、パーソナルコンピューティングの今後と題して、ヒューレット・パッカード・カンパニー、プリンティングパーソナルシステムズ事業、テクノロジー・ビジョンストラテジー部門シニアディレクター、アンドリュー・ボーエルよりお話しさせていただきます。アンドリュー、プリーズ・カム・アップ・トゥ・ザ・ステージ。ヒューレット・パーカードのアンドルでございます。よろしくお願いします。まあ、それしかできないので<笑>、これから英語で頑張ります。Before I start, I just wanted to say、uh, what a great pleasure it is to be here. More so because 30 years ago, I first came to Japan and went to high school in Numazu, in Shizuoka Ken no Numazu. And it was a wonderful year, probably the best year of my life. Lived with a Japanese host family. As I said, went to school. And then about 20 years ago, I came back to Japan for the second time. And I worked in Tokyo for about three years. And I had my first daughter in Japan. And I like to joke, she was born, or nearly born, nearly born, on the Keosen between、uh, Medai Mai and Shinjuku Eki. But luckily, We made it in time. But I feel very close to Japan and I feel very close to you guys, and I'm really happy to be back. Today, I want to talk to you about the trends that we're seeing emerging in the industry. And I want to talk a little bit about how HP views those trends, and then a little bit on how you can use those trends to innovate in your businesses. Let me start with just talking about change. As we know, there's a lot of change in the world today, from politics to the environment, the economy, and of course, technology, maybe especially technology. Over the next 10 years, we'll add another billion people to the world's population, bringing the total to over 8 billion people around the world. But not just people. By some estimates, More than 200 billion devices will join us online. As I'm sure you're aware, we now spend a lot of time on email. Over 25% of our time we spend on email. We check our phones 150 times a day. Just during this session, you may all check it that often. I hope not. I hope not. We, we share 1.2 billion photos a day on Facebook and social networks. We, we send 24 billion text messages a day. And this pace of change is accelerating. I mean, the information that is coming at us day in and day out is, is overwhelming. And is it really any wonder that we start to feel like this? Information overload. So much information coming at us, so many decisions we need to make, so many people. We need to communicate with. And the reason is actually very simple technology and information increases exponentially. And it's been increasing exponentially for the last 50 years. But our human brains don't. <laughs> our human brains don't scale in the same way. In fact, my human brain actually goes down over time now. <laughs> So, the problem is really only, only going to get worse. But the other effect of this change is that technology enhances our human abilities, it creates new opportunities. We can now work from wherever we want, whenever we want. We can communicate with anybody we want, anywhere in the world. And we can be anything we want today because of technology. We can be creators, we can be designers, we can be publishers, we can be makers, we can be manufacturers. Everything becomes possible. So, how we deal with this change and the world that we create from it 
I mean, really, that's the opportunity in front of all of us today. Because time is our most valuable resource. So using technology to reduce that overload and using technology to free up more time for us to be creators, to be innovative, to spend time with customers, to live our lives is really, really important. So along those lines, I just wanted to share a, a video that we created that talks a little bit about the world that we'd like to help create with you. So with that. We believe in a world where the lines are blurred, between the physical and digital, between work and home, between front office and back office, between makers and manufacturers where the technology takes a back seat to a human-centered design, unleashing creativity, self-expression, and a whole new wave of innovation. We believe in a world where people and things connect. We're moving from an era where people need to interact with machines to get things done, to a world where technology becomes more intuitive. It learns from us, it anticipates our needs. We believe in a world where technology can make us more human. As machines take over our mundane and repetitive tasks, we can focus on what we want to do instead of what we have to do. We believe in a world where evolution meets revolution. Where harnessing technology is going to spark a new era of creativity, productivity, and potential. This revolution is increasingly driven by a world that is closely connected by mobile devices, social media, and the internet. At HP, we know how to blur the lines to integrate these technologies seamlessly into our everyday life. With our arsenal of smart connected devices, software, and cloud services, we are ready to lead this revolution. We believe in this world. Where technology surprises us and amazes us. Where innovation and imagination leads us to a better future. Where the best is yet to come. We believe. Ine. So, <laughs> we can be anything I said. We can even be bad movie actors as well, which is good sometimes. So, how do we create this world? And what are some of the industry trends that are shaping it? So maybe for the next 25 minutes, I just wanted to go through some of those trends with you. And I'll go through them very quickly, and I'll do it by sharing some examples of things that are happening to give you a sense of what's real today. So I'll start with mobility. Today, there's about 5.1 billion people with mobile phones. What's really interesting to me is that there's a billion people living under the poverty line that have a mobile phone. And I joke that uh, it's really changing Maslow's hierarchy, that, that hierarchy of basic human needs. We're moving from food, water, shelter to food, water, mobility, shelter. Mobility has become that important to people. But mobile technology is also becoming small enough and powerful enough that it's become wearable. You know, it's not just the devices that we might wear on our wrist for fitness, though. The technology is so small and powerful that it's becoming infused with the clothing and the jewelry and the watches that we wear every day. We now have wearables for shoes, wearables for socks, Wearable belts, wearable shirts, watches, glasses, contact lenses, everything. So let me share a couple of examples to show you what I mean. This is a company in San Francisco who makes intelligent workout gear. These clothes have sensors in them that can tell you how fast your heart is beating, how fast you're breathing. They can tell you how much you're working your muscles. They can tell you if you're working too hard. It connects with your phone. And then it can provide real-time coaching. For example, go harder, slow down. 
So not only is it a wearable, it's also a real-time fitness, uh, personal fit, fitness uh, instructor. Or this one, which is a smart sock. <laughs> this is for runners, okay? This is a sock you wear, and it tells you how you're placing your foot, right? Where you're putting the pressure on your feet. And for runners, this is really important. When you run a lot, you need to run with good technique so you can run for a long time. And this sock helps you do that. And again, it's connected to your phone and through your headset. It will provide real-time coaching on how you're running and your running technique. So a lot of these wearables obviously connect to your phone and have value-added services like those real-time. You can get one for golf as well. It'll measure your golf swing and it'll give you real-time swing feedback. So for those of you that enjoy playing golf, you might want to check that out. I know I want to. <laughs> Something has to work. And fashion. Fashion is also very important. When we wear something on, our, on ourself, it needs to look good. What we wear says something about who we are to the world around us. And you've probably seen a lot of new smartwatches being announced, right? But they don't look very good, typically. They're really clunky and ugly. But for wearables to go mainstream, they need to look good enough to wear. Pebble is a company in the US, and this is their second generation of watch. And as you can see, it's starting to look like a real watch. I mean, it even tells the time. Pretty amazing. But it also does so much more. So I think for, for wearables that fashion is going to be very, very important if we expect people to, to use these new technologies. And it's not just fashion, it's brand as well. Companies invest a lot of money in establishing a brand for themselves. Think of Oakley glasses, Ray, Ray-Ban sunglasses. Now, you've all heard of Google Glass, okay? Google have just done a deal with the makers of Ray-Ban and Oakley so that those brands can embed that Google Glass technology in their products. And I think this is also something that I think you'll see more and more is that the brands that you know and love today, that you wear today, they'll just be start becoming more intelligent. And the ecosystem is important. The wearables market is very new. But what really matters is it's not just the hardware, it's the software and the services that come with the wearable. Google has just announced Android Wear which is an operating system for wearables. And the reason that this is important is because now developers of, of wearable hardware now get access to all of the Android developer community and all of the Android software and services that they can add to their devices. And this is an example of the Motorola watch that they've announced, this one with the circular face that will use Android Wear. But it's not just consumer wearables. Wearables are going to be really important in the corporate space as well. Many companies are already experimenting with them, what they can use them for. There's doctors in the US that use them during surgery now. Instead of being distracted, when you need information about a patient, instead of being distracted and moving and looking at a tablet device, they're wearing Google Glass. They're getting that real-time patient information while they're operating. And one of the, the, the use cases for corporate wearables that I believe will, will kickstart this is security. This is a wearable that actually connects to your heart rate and your heartbeat, your ECG, which is unique to you. So using this wearable, you can authenticate yourself to the network, to the building, and that is done through this unique heartbeat of yours. And if you thought that's cool, then there's even a pill you can swallow now. This pill will dilute with your gastric juices, right? And it will produce an electrical signal that when you touch the car door handle or the doorknob of your house or a computer, you'll transmit that unique signal that this pill generates inside you to authenticate you to, to anything in the physical world. Now, maybe not all of us will want to swallow a pill and become a walking password. 
but who knows one day. And Google recently announced a contact lens that includes sensors, and it's for, di for diabetics. So this contact lens will detect from the fluid in your eye your blood sugar level. And if it notices your blood sugar is dropping and becoming low, it glows red in your eyesight. So for people with diabetes, they can get real-time feedback on their blood sugar levels. This will change lives. This technology will change lives. And maybe just a weirder example. Can you imagine tattooing electronics onto your body? This is not a permanent tattoo, but you can tattoo now, or the technology is becoming available, where you could tattoo a microphone. This is a microphone circuit. You could tattoo it on your arm and use it to talk with or through. The military already used this for soldiers to communicate through something like this. So all of this is becoming possible. Some of it further out, but a lot of it quite close. So fashion will be important. Technology will integrate with existing brands. And we're only just beginning here. But it's not just the technology we wear. Technology is becoming so small, powerful, and cost-effective that it's becoming embedded in the everyday objects around us. And this is leading to a trend called Internet of Things. You've heard of this before. Pretty soon, everything will be online and connected, from your toothbrush to your home appliances to your car to the roads you travel on, the buildings you work in, the cities you live in, everything. And this, in my opinion, will have a profound effect on how we live our lives and run our businesses. Again, a few examples. I wasn't joking about the toothbrush. There is a connected toothbrush now. I'm not quite sure what it does. I think it will tell how well you brush your teeth. It may let your mum know if you're not brushing your teeth very well. Maybe it does real-time coaching on teeth brushing technique. But the point is that even a toothbrush will become connected and intelligent. And this is one of my favorites. This is an intelligent electronic bartender. It will mix drinks for you. There's an app for it. You select your favorite drink, and it will make it for you. And it senses your mood, so it will know whether you want a certain drink or a different drink. And I love this, is it will tell if you've had a hard day, and it will mix you a double <laughs> instead of a single. I think that's something we all need in our homes, don't you, one day? We have home appliances now that text you their status. I don't know how many of you had kids or have kids. I have to communicate even with my kids in the house through text messaging. <laughs> now I have to text with my home appliances as well. And the first Internet of Things cyber attack was recently uh, noticed. People were using your connected fridges and televisions to launch cyber attack. And this might seem a little funny and weird, but this is actually very serious. That as everything becomes connected, you do need to think about security. And the ecosystem for the Internet of Things is also really important. I mean, think about this. We have three billion smartphones today. And the war for the OS in the smartphone area is, is pretty much done. It's Android and iOS for the most part. In 10 years, 200 billion devices. There is no established platform. This is completely greenfield. So I really look forward to seeing what everybody does to become the dominant player in the Internet of Things in the future. And Google recently bought a company called Nest for three billion dollars, maybe, maybe to get a start on that. Or maybe because the connected home is a pretty big opportunity. And I don't know what the state of affairs are in Japan, but in the US now you can buy intelligent lighting. You can buy, as I said, intelligent thermostats. You can buy intelligent garage doors. Everything is intelligent, but it's all disjointed. It's really hard to get things working together. And I think in this space especially, what's needed is a, a platform approach where things can talk to each other. So when you're driving home, it senses you're five minutes away. It opens the garage door. It turns your lights on. 
but has Monsieur start making you a drink? And all of this should just happen automatically. And when everything is intelligent, when everything has IT embedded in it, what does that mean for the IT industry? It's no longer a division between computers and things. Everything becomes computing. And what happens when we take these intelligent devices and we give them the ability to move around in the physical world with us, the sensors, the mechanics? Well, what do we get then? We get robots. This is one of my favorite areas. I love, I love robots. We've got robots in the home. We've got robots in the factories. We've got medical robots. Robots are not science fiction. They're here today. For example, in the US anyway, there's robots that vacuum your floors. There are now robots that wash your windows and that clean your barbecue. Now really, who wouldn't want robots like that? And why? Do you know that we all spend 100 billion hours a year cleaning our house and mowing our lawns? Can you imagine if robots could do it for us? 100 billion hours of human potential is given back to us. I was at TED recently. Edward Snowden, the NSA whistleblower, joined us at the TED conference. I was really surprised to see him because he was actually physically in Russia. He joined by robot. What was interesting to me was that people interacted with him as though he were a human. Because they could talk to him, he could interact back, and he could move around the conference. So telepresence robots are also becoming more and more useful. And this is Baxter. Baxter works in a factory. Baxter is a general purpose robot. He can be trained to do anything. He works side by side next to humans. He earns $4 an hour and he works 24-7. Robots like Baxter are coming. And you've all heard of Google's self-driving cars. Over a million people lose their lives every year through traffic accidents. This car has been on the road for 500,000 miles and has only had one accident so far. And that was human error. But think about this. What happens when all of the cars on the road are self-driving? What happens to all of the jobs for people who drive for a living? Cab drivers, truck drivers. Or if there's no more accidents, what happens to the auto insurance industry? So my point is, while these may seem interesting and sexy technologies, that they're going to change the world as we know it. They're going to affect more than just technology. This is an Amazon commercial drone. They're testing it for delivering packages that you buy online. What happens when commercial drone delivers all of the, uh, the things we buy? What happens to the companies that do that today? And this is uh, an unmanned drone that Facebook were interested in to provide internet connectivity to developing countries. So you would send up these unmanned drones and they would just circle the earth. And they'd be like access points, internet access points to provide, as I said, internet connectivity for everybody. And this is commercial chess at its finest because earlier this week Google bought this company. Maybe to keep this technology away from Facebook. I'm not sure, but these things are happening. And at HP, you may not think about us when it comes to robotics, but we have in our labs research into robot, robotic software, software that mimics how the human brain works and allows robots to learn and become smarter. So again, robots are not science fiction. They're here today. More are coming. So if we take the devices that we wear, you know, the devices, the Internet of Things around us, and our friends, the robots, 
you know, all of these new technology form factors are going to need smarter, more intelligent software that doesn't take so much time on our part to use, software that's intuitive. And this is driving a trend I call contextual computing. Okay? Contextual computing is just a fancy word for personalized software. Software that knows, you know, we, we, we know our location, our likes and dislikes, our preferences. Software that can use all of that information to make more intelligent choices for us. To offer us the things that we need only when we need them. And probably the best example of this is Google Now. I don't know how many people here use Google Now. Think of this as a virtual assistant. It can tell you what time to leave your home in the morning based on where you need to be, based on the traffic conditions. When you're walking past a supermarket, it knows you need bread and milk. Reminds you, go and buy them. But now, think about this applied to the enterprise. Think about what it would be like to have an enterprise virtual assistant. So we're working on this as well. This is something that we're leveraging our autonomy, back-end, big data assets with. So if you're uh, doing instant messaging with somebody, it can, in real time, do a real-time search and bring back information about the, the person you might be talking about or the product you're talking about. Now, if you're on the phone, it can listen into your phone call and it can do the same thing. So you don't have to go off and search for all of this information and collate it all yourself and understand it. it will do all of that for you. So you can spend more time being human, being creative. Or if you're attending a meeting, it knows who you're meeting with and it can pull information from across social networks and from sales data and then it can say, you've met this person before. Here's some things you have in common. Here's more information about them. Here's who you, know, who you know in common. All of these things become possible. So for me, contextual computing really is just big data for human experiences. And I think the other thing that's really driving how we interact with technology is that all of those interactions are becoming more immersive and natural. And this is driving something I call immersive experiences. So, you know, in the past we've used keyboards and displays, right? And today we're all very used to using touch. But more and more you're starting to see voice, gesturing, eye tracking, even thought. And if you thought we left smell out of the equation, there's even a device now that will emit smell for you. This is an alarm clock, sort of a cradle for your iPhone, if you will. And for those of you that are more likely to wake up with the strong smell of bacon, or maybe miso, miso soup in Japan, okay? When your alarm goes off, it emits a miso soup smell. Something to get you out of bed, right? So smell is also something that we're seeing being used in technology interaction. And I mentioned thought, and I wasn't joking. This is a device from Emotive. When you have a thought, it creates a unique brainwave. And this device that you wear can pick up that unique brainwave and then do something with it. So you can now think into your computers. My biggest worry with this one is I'll start using it and nothing will happen. So I'm going to stay away from this for now. And here's a virtual reality device, the Oculus Rift. I don't know if you've seen this yet. But this is a fully immersive 3D experience. It's like a Star Trek, a Star Trek holodeck. Okay? When you turn your head in the real world, you'll turn your head in the virtual world. When you move in the real world, you'll walk in that virtual world. And Facebook just bought this company for $2 billion because they believe this could be the next platform for computing. And if you think it's just games, it's not. Tesco, which is a major UK retailer, developed and launched a virtual store. You put this on, you can now go to a Tesco store. You can walk the aisles. You can look at the products on the shelves. 
you can buy them and they'll be delivered to you in the physical world. Now in the past, Second Life was something, you've probably heard of Second Life. For me, this is completely different. This is fully immersive. Technologies like this are on the horizon. And the other thing that's driving these experiences is that the physical and digital world, worlds are blurring as well, right? Augmented reality, where everything in the physical world has a digital experience associated with it. And this is my favorite set of glasses. This is augmented reality glasses. These guys have a demo whereby when you're looking through these glasses, you can see the physical world, but it has a digital overlay as well. And they can project a virtual smartphone into your hand. It only exists in the virtual world, but you can use it to make phone calls with. You can download apps to it. You can play Sudoku on it. But it doesn't exist. It's virtual. Now imagine. Imagine when you can upgrade your phone without having to buy a new phone. You just create a new virtual phone. And one way this technology is being used is for people who have difficulty seeing, visually impaired. You put these glasses on, they connect to your phone, which connects to an earphone, and they can help you know if the light at the crossing is red or green. When you walk into a supermarket and you can't see the boxes, you can just point at a box and it will tell you this is a box of cereal. This is the brand of cereal. So for people who can't see, this is significantly changing and helping with their lives as well. So there are really great, compelling use cases for this sort of technology. HP is doing something called Live Photo, where when you wave your phone over a photograph, that's been associated with a video, the video plays. But more than that, we're actually trying to enable every piece of paper to have that same experience. So everything that you print can have an associated digital experience. That might be authentication. Is this an original copy of this document? Or architectural plans, maybe changes that have been made since it's been printed can be shown. So paper can become intelligent. And as an example in South Korea, here's an example of, again, Tesco, that used HP printing to print a, a storefront on latex that was then put onto the subway walls. And like in Japan, a lot of people work very late and don't have a lot of time to shop in South Korea. So this was a printed storefront. People in the subway could walk up to it and through a QR code, buy things on their way home. And then what would happen is that after they arrived home, those products would be delivered to them. So you don't, now as a, as a retailer, you don't have to set up physical retail space. You can just print your storefront. You can have storefronts in subway stations. You can have them anywhere now. People can interact with those and buy things through them. Think of the possibilities there. So for me, immersive experiences are things that we all need to be thinking about. How to make the experiences we have with technology fun, different, compelling. And I think the same is very true in the commercial world as it is in the consumer world. So why am I telling you about trends? Why are they important? Well, trends point to the future. They point to what our customers, all of our customers, are going to expect in the future. And one way that you can use them is to take your business focus, whatever that might be, and just try combining it with one or more of these trends to see what new ideas that helps generate for you. So if you're in retail, how can you use contextual computing or immersive experiences to provide a better experience for your shoppers. Or if you're in manufacturing, how can you use robots or 3D printing to provide a better experience for your workers? Technology trends are really important because they're the drivers of innovation. 
So one quick example here. For those of you, and many of you may already be aware of this, but the Olympics is coming to Tokyo in 2020, of course. And for people like myself, it's really hard to read Japanese kanji. I love the food displays. You know what you're going to get, right? But NTT Docomo are developing some glasses, some augmented reality glasses, where foreigners coming to the Olympics can look at a sign in Japanese or a menu in Japanese and have that translated to their local language. Now that's going to create a much better experience for people who can't read Japanese when they come to the Olympics. And they'll go home probably a lot happier for having had that experience. So this is one example of how you take wearables and apply it to translation. There's many unlimited number of uh, examples for this. And just very quickly, if you're thinking, well, how do I even start? What do I do? I've got this idea, but what skills do I need? You know, at this event today and probably in your interactions with HP, you hear us talking about mobility, about cloud, about big data, about security. These are the fundamental building blocks of these trends. These are the skills that we all need to develop, which is why HP's been spending so much time and effort developing skills in these areas. And I'll just go back to why. Why is that even important? Because I think when we move technology into the background, where we use technology to, to help with that overload that I mentioned before, right? When we use it to create more compelling intuitive experience as well. That frees up time. Time, our most valuable resource, time that we can spend with customers. Time that we can innovate new ideas. And really, time that we can use to be more successful at whatever we want to achieve. So with that, I'd like to say everything's possible. We get to create the future. So I look forward to working with you to, to help create the most compelling future we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.